and it's about time that I upgraded my PC. And after years of supporting Intel when it comes to my system, I've been going through some character growth. Every single PC that I have built for a friend or family member has been a Ryzen PC since Zen 1, so since the first generation of Ryzen processors. Every one of them love their machines to this day, going as far as to still rock their systems for creative work up until now. While I find my workflow being affected by performance constantly, to be completely honest, and every time that I make an upgrade to, well, guess what? I'm already at the very end of the cycle for that chipset, so that means that if, if I ever want to upgrade the CPU, I have to upgrade the motherboard, and so on and so forth. That's happened to me a couple of times already, and so I decided to go all out here on a new Ryzen 9 system with the most expensive PC I have ever built, going at around $4,500, but one that I still do not at all regret building, so let's go ahead and dive right in. before we continue, I just wanted to remind you that we have a Twitch channel where we stream every Friday and Saturday from 8pm and to 10pm Eastern Time, so why not go ahead and drop a follow? And also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and also make sure to check out the merch store. There's plenty of black and white sweetness to choose from up there, so go ahead and check that out. And then make sure to take a look at the podcast as well, as the podcast always goes live every Wednesday and Sunday. And with that said, enough rambling, let us get straight into the video. So let's go ahead and talk about the parts first. And my CPU of choice, mostly, was the Ryzen 9 3950X. I almost went with Threadripper. Really did, but decided to hold back on that since, since it would have been way more expensive and it wouldn't have been much more beneficial to me, especially all that much considering just the kind of workload that I'm going to be doing. Another factor here is that the 5950X was very hard to find that MSRP and I wanted to upgrade soon, so I just went with this chip overall since it helped me save some money. And this is a 16 core 32 thread CPU that will definitely suffice with all of my work such as video editing, streaming, and animation work. So honestly, I don't mind going with Zen 2 this time around as I barely feel like I'm actually losing much here at all since I believe that the difference between Zen 3 and Zen 2 at the very least the 59 50x and 3950x is just about like 10 to 13 percent not that big of a deal and to cool the cpu i actually went with the cooler master master air ma 620m air cooler <laughs> this is a twin tower cooler with rgb lights and while it is large it is not as big as I thought it would be. Not that it really matters since it is all going into a full tower case anyway, but it is a cooler that will definitely suffice here without a doubt. And all these components are going to be going into my Gigabyte B55 AORS master motherboard. It's got room for pretty much everything I need with three PCIe slots and three M.2 slots as well, though these won't be used entirely just yet. I'm only going to be using one of them. This motherboard does have RGB lighting but they don't seem to work on my particular unit, which is annoying, but I don't have time to return this just for the lack of light. Though, so honestly, this motherboard does also offer good overclocking capabilities, which will be very important in the future, and that is arguably way more important than it reproducing pretty lights. And now, on my previous system, I actually went with 32 gigs of RAM at first, and then I later upgraded to 64 gigs of RAM. But this time, I won't be compromising at all. After Effects will eat up as much RAM as you have, and then demand and even more, so I decided to try my luck at 120 gigs of G-Scode RGB RAM. This is overkill, but will definitely be enough to handle everything that I need to throw at the system. Unless I used After Effects on my previous machine, I, it, it very much struggled to chew through 64 gigs, and I'm sure the 120 gigs will be a much bigger challenge here too. I want the system to last me a long time after all, which is why I went ahead and, and made this investment anyway. And my GPU of choice here was one that I simply wasn't willing to compromise on, even if it meant paying a stupid scalper. I bought a Zotac RTX 3090 with 24 gigs of VRAM. I plan on using this machine as more of a workstation machine, but it doesn't hurt to have fantastic gaming performance with reliable ray tracing support, of course. This was a painful purchase without a doubt, but one that ended up being worth it in the end since I didn't really spend that much more as I found it for around $1,800. So it was just marked up by, yes, maybe a couple of hundred bucks more. Still quite a bit more to have to pay, but if you need a computer for work, sometimes you can justify these things. And in the long term, I do appreciate having made this investment, or I'm pretty sure that at the very least in the future, I will end up appreciating having made this. And there are going to be the newer RTX 3080 Ti cards coming out 
at some point, but I know that I'm going to fail to get one at MSRP when they, when they launch. So honestly, I would rather just remove those concerns and the weight and just go with this. And while the prices aren't absolutely terrible, I might as well get a card now. So yeah, that's essentially why I ended up going that route. And since I'll be streaming, I decided to go with an internal capture card this time around. Here's going to be the Elgato 4K60 Pro. I use a Panasonic Lumix GX85 for streaming, and having a capture card for that is a must. Plus, a capture card that is capable of supporting higher resolutions when capturing gameplay is going to be a great gateway to future proofing and things like that, and who knows, maybe I'll want to become a gaming channel someday, right? And to power all of this, I went with a 1000 watt EVGA power supply, a fully modular one, obviously. The RTX 3090 is a power hog for sure, and it requires two GPU slots on your power supply to be powered properly, similarly to the RTX 3080, but not like the 3070. This will give my system enough leeway to support every one of the current components with room for more, but I don't know if it'll be good enough to support two RTX 3090s in the future. It is a foolish thing to do now anyway, so I guess it doesn't really matter. This is more than enough for sure for the time being. At least. And for storage, I actually went with two drives. One of them was a two terabyte NVMe SSD from PNY. I went with this for the sake of having enough storage for all of my important software and Windows, of course, and things like that. But Adobe does create a lot of cache that adds up over time, so it'll be nice to have this kind of amount of storage around. Plus the speeds on an N.2 SSD are absolutely insane. And I know that it'll be worth it over time. But for dump storage, I actually went with a WD Ultra Star 8TB hard drive. This is for games, other not so important software, and literal dump storage. Just need it to hold everything and last me a good while. So that's why I went with this one. And now all of these components and a few more are going inside this full tower case from Entities. Now it's tempered glass pretty much everywhere, and it does come with five RGB fans and a little cheap controller for, now for switching modes and colors on the fans. Honestly, I just really liked how the case looks, but I don't like that the messy side of the case, you know, like where the cables are going to be managed and everything, is completely exposed since it uses a glass panel on the back. So I bought a roll of carbon fiber vinyl to cover it up and give it some style on the side as well, in case anybody happens to look at that side, even though that's highly, highly, highly unlikely. But it's also for my own sanity. And up top, there's still room for four 120 millimeter fans. So I went ahead and bought four 120 millimeter Cooler Master RGB fans. These fans are beautiful, but I did mostly get them because there was enough room and I do like the idea of having more fans to help with air circulation in general. And now I always run out of USB ports on any PC I've ever built. I actually had three USB hubs connected to my previous build. So I bought this seven port USB 3.0 hub that connects straight into the PCIe slot as well as keeping a promise that I won't use that many devices all at once. It's out of the way this way and I do get to take full advantage of the speeds this way since it is going to be an internal card instead of an external dock. And that was a lot, I know, but now we can actually get straight into building. So as always, we're going to start by opening the case from both sides since I know that we're going to need to access both sides very frequently here. So now I'm going to install the motherboard by aligning it with the IO slot as the IO shield is already pre-installed onto this motherboard, which is one of my favorite things about it. I've never liked having to deal with the IO shield. Once it's aligned, we can actually just start to screw it down from every hole that we can find to secure the motherboard onto the case. And then from here, we can actually get straight into installing the CPU. Let's go ahead and lift up the retention arm first to then properly align the arrows on each unit. So for instance, we're going to want to align the golden arrow on the CPU to the gray arrow on the edge of the socket and then gently place the CPU down to avoid bending any pins by accident. And then from here, like once it's all the way in, just give it a small wiggle to make sure that it is actually properly seated and that it's not moving. Once you've done that, you can just go ahead and close down the retention arm and you're, and you're pretty much good to go from there. That's how you're going to know that your CPU is secure. But before installing the CPU cooler, which is going to be very necessary, let's go ahead and put in the RAM first. We're going to unclip each corner on each slot since we will be using all four of them and go ahead and placing in the memory stick until you hear two clicks for each slot as there are going to be two two clips for each one 
Now we can start installing the cooler right after everything is finally in. And this is now finally starting to go somewhere. So this was actually the most tedious thing about this build. As it usually is for any build I've worked on, the cooler is always the most difficult thing, especially if you're using a custom one. So go ahead and remove the plastic clips from the motherboard surrounding the CPU first. Now you need to get a backplate for the mounting system, which should come included with this kit already to actually be able to hold itself up. Get the brackets and then screw everything down into place so that we can actually start installing the cooler itself. And then all that we need to do from here first before actually putting in the cooler is just putting in some thermal paste. So as you might be able to see here, there might be a little bit more than most people are accustomed to. In fact, it's more than I intended to put in since we usually want something about the size of an uncooked grain of rice, as Linus used to say, but I did end up putting in a little bit more than that. But I think that it's going to be perfectly okay. It's really not an obscene amount, but just, you know, FYI, you might want to go with less. And then once you've finally done that, we can actually start to align the cooler itself and then place it down. From here, just screw it down from both corners, or from the top, I should say, to secure it until the cooler is nice and tight. Then once you've actually shook it around and know that it's not actually moving from its slot then you're very much good to go and you know that the cpu and the cooler are making proper contact so let's do the m.2 ssd since we're here already so we're actually going to pick the middle slot since that's the most that's most accessible at the moment and then slot it in the drive from here so we just have to unscrew this little spot here and then put in the drive and then we can actually screw that part down and then screw the actual thermal pad on top of it and then you're pretty much good to go and then we can flip over the entire system to install the actual hard drive so just take out one of the hard drive bays and then screw the hard drive into it until it's properly secured and make sure that it will not move then slot it back in and then screw down the bay onto the case so that it doesn't move from its slot now at this point i do start getting the power supply together to plug in every cable that i know that i'm going to be needing here it is best to do this now before slotting it in because then the ports will be way too annoying to reach later if you first put in the power supply. It's just not worth the hassle. So once we have the power supply decked out, we slot it into the back with the fan facing downwards as this case actually has an air filter on the bottom. So we might as well do it this way for better air circulation. Screw it in and then you're pretty much good to start installing everything else. And now we start installing the cooler master fans onto the top of the case, which involves just spacing them out correctly and then doing them one by one from the top. We generally want, want to be able to do all four corners of each one. So yeah, this took a little bit of time, but it's all good. It's one of the easier parts of this build for sure, but this will add some necessary style to the build overall, if you ask me. Now we're going to flip the tower over again, and this is when we finally start installing the PCIe components, which we're going to start with the GPU, FYI. Remove two brackets from the back, as this GPU takes up two slots, and then unclip the PCIe slot that you're going to be installing this graphics card onto to install the GPU until you hear a click. And then you can screw it back down once it is actually secured so that it doesn't move from its slot at all. And then that's pretty much all that you have to do there until we start plugging everything in. Now we're going to do the same thing with the capture card on the next PCIe slot, except that this one only needs one slot. Then we do the same thing for the USB 3.0 hub with just one slot remaining here as well. So yeah, from here it is going to be a pretty simple process, but the most complicated thing here was actually the cable management. Everything is in, but we have to plug in every power supply cable and case cable onto each component and this process lasted far too long for my liking an embarrassing amount of time in fact so there's no footage of that no speed runs or anything like that so i'm going to snap my fingers and you should see the finalized build and then we can actually get into actual testing so here we go
So let's go ahead and start off with some game testing. First, I tested out Final Fantasy XV because this game can be really demanding at the highest settings. I don't have a 4K display down here, so all of my tests were actually done in 1440p with absolutely everything maxed out and without access to deep learning super sampling since it only works in 4K. I do get a stable 55 frames per second on Final Fantasy XV. I was disappointed here if I'm honest and then I realized that performance would have been better on a 4K display with deep learning super sampling instead of your usual render methods. Even though I do have to admit that usually, you know, like a regular rasterization or anti-aliasing are usually better than deep learning super sampling when it comes to the visuals themselves. Those actually give you a sharper image and I found that deep learning super sampling actually kind of gives you a blurrier image and that's just not something that I got here since I wasn't using deep learning super sampling at all. So honestly, it was worth the trade-off here. I was still very, very much expecting at the very least hoping that it would still s surpass that threshold. And then I also realized that I had absolutely everything on this machine completely maxed out so I do have to be a little bit more reasonable in that regard and honestly I do love how this game looks here definitely a lot more than what I did back when I had my i7 8700k and RTX 2080 PC at the same resolution with most things maxed out but I would usually get about 40 frames per second regardless and I would actually often drop if anything and now that wasn't with everything maxed out, but most things maxed out, I would say. So this is still a very big improvement if I really want to give myself credit, which I do deserve. But I do have Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which does actually both support ray tracing and deep learning super sampling. At 1440p with literally everything maxed out, including ultra ray trace shadows and deep learning super sampling, it was easy to stay over 100 frames per second. In more heavily populated areas in both the benchmark and in the actual game, it would actually drop to around 74 frames per second at the absolute lowest I would say, but it always stayed at well above 60 frames per second almost no matter what, which is the golden number and you get a very beautiful gaming experience experience that way. You could always just get rid of ray tracing there and get a much nicer frame rate for sure, but hey, there's no denying that RTX technology has gotten much more efficient with the current gen cards, that is for sure. And now here is Quake 2 RTX, which was honestly something I expected much better performance out of. This game is super old with just ray tracing slapped onto it, or maybe I'm just exaggerating there. And even then, this system delivers on roughly 90 frames per second. I know, right? I'm complaining about that. But again, look at the game. <laughs> I did honestly expect a lot better, but it is what it is. Again, I'm maxing out everything on each game to see how much this hardware combination can handle. And there we have it regarding Quake 2 RTX. And in 3D Mark Port Royal, to be exact, with everything maxed out and enabled at 1440p, the benchmark ran at around 33 frames per second on average, and we ended up achieving a score of 8,443 in the full ray tracing test, that is. This is not an easy test to run by any means, so I would consider the score to be pretty good in general. Though this is just a benchmark after all, and remember, this is with all ray tracing features completely maxed out, just like really pushing this graphics card. And that's kind of the entire point of this test, is just to see how well your graphics card does handle ray tracing in general. And now for actual work, like rendering in DaVinci Resolve, this machine is an absolute monster. <laughs> Timeline performance is always smooth. I've experienced literally zero hiccups along the way. Stabilizing footage just takes a few seconds. Green screening is very quick. Switching between editing panels is very quick, unlike how it was in my previous PC where it would actually take almost an entire minute to switch between panels, which is, which is pretty insane. This is just like such a noticeable improvement to me. And I was using DaVinci Resolve Studio on both machines. This PC has dramatically sped up my workflow, that's for sure. Rendering is another thing that is insanely fast on this machine. A 10 minute 4K video at 24 frames per second with GPU rendering will render in about three to four minutes and resolves own renderer. This is incredible, as performance really has improved immensely from my previous system, and this is what I wanted and even more to be completely honest here. So I'm very happy with the performance that I've been getting in actual work. So in conclusion, this machine is a total monster. It's very expensive though, and not something I can recommend people to just immediately flock to. If you can wait, then the RTX 3080 Ti with 20 gigs of VRAM is coming and will be a very exciting product when it comes out. And I say that because stock is still not impossible to find that MSRP when it comes to, you know, current graphics cards out on the market. Eh, 
asterisk and sadly i don't see this being resolved anytime soon at least not, not until this global issue gets resolved first. With that said, I don't regret my purchase at all, and it took a lot of hunting and saving to get these parts together, but I'm glad to have actually gone ahead with the system, and now I know that I'll be able to, you know, be a lot more efficient at my work and streaming and things like that, so I don't regret it in the slightest. That's a beautiful monster for sure. And if you're interested in purchasing any of the parts that I used to build this PC, then I'll be making sure to leave them linked down in the description. These are all going to be affiliate links, of course. And if you actually would like to finance any of these parts, as long as they're from Amazon, then I'm going to be leaving links to Abunda too, because that's going to give you the opportunity to actually finance some of these things, which is not going to require a credit card from you at all. And I know that if you're going to be building a PC, you're probably going to want to not, not hit hard with those thousands of dollars you might end up spending on your PC right away and you might want to take your wallet just a little bit more easily so then that's going to be a super helpful tool I'm going to be leaving links to both Amazon and Abunda down in the description just depending on which method you would rather use if you use either one it does help out the channel quite a bit so yeah I'd appreciate that quite a bit also we've got the Tech Summit podcast so do make sure to stop by and watch that for any any notifications just just subscribe and turn on the notification bell I would love to see you over there and just hear your thoughts and what it is that you have to say. Also, we just started a Discord pretty recently. Links to that are going to be in the, in the description too. So do make sure to click on that as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts over there too. There's also going to be a link to my Twitch if you would like to watch my live streams every Friday and Saturday from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter too for any hot takes, right? But with that said, this has been Francisco from Tech Summit. Thank you so much for watching, and I will be seeing you all later. Enjoy.